Welcome to Under the Fig Tree Podcast. In today's episode, hosts Rev. Micah Glenn and Rev. Dr. Ben Haupt talk theology and life as they meditate under the fig tree. What's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome back to Under the Fig Tree Podcast. I am your host, Rev. Micah Glenn, of course, joined by my highly esteemed and established co-host, Rev. Dr. Ben Haupt, uh, and we're joined by a very special guest, Rev. Dr. James Bonick. How are you today? I'm doing well, thanks. So, Dr. Bonick, I think in conversation, we typically know you by Jim now. Is that fine for the rest that of the podcast? Would be just yeah, great. just, right. just yeah. to, you know, I like to introduce people formally, but yep. then no, that's uh, great. continue conversationally. So, welcome, Dr. Bonick. Uh, you are the executive director of pastoral education. For Synod. So you work at the International Correct. Center down in Kirkwood. Uh, for us and for our guests, tell us a little bit about what your work as the executive director in that program for Synod entails. Sure. There are actually a number of things. Um, one is um, I work for the chief mission officer, uh, Kevin Robson, mm-hmm. and part of his description is um, to be the overseer or the advocate of the seminaries, uh, pre-seminary education, seminary education, uh, and so on. So some of the things that we work on in the Office of Pastoral Education are um, the Pastoral Formation Committee, which is a bylaw made up of the two presidents of the seminaries and chief mission officer and myself. Mm -hmm. We talk about routes to ministry and such. A lot of our work gets... um, Uh, moves toward the convention. Um, We uh, uh, joint seminary fund. uh, I write for that and help mission advancement for that. Work with the Concordia universities and pre-seminary programs. Um, For instance, um, what's uh, um, the curriculum? How much does it cost? How do we recruit? Which we'll talk about later on, of course. Um, I'm in charge of the PALS program, post-seminary applied learning and support, although we now have a full-time director uh, that works with that, Jonathan Maynor. Hmm. Um, so, those are, so those are some of the main things. I meet with the provost uh, a couple times a year of the seminaries, the vicarage supervisors, do a lot of writing. So, Sure. And there's this, there's this program uh, set apart to serve that you lead. And this is, uh, this is a program that um, really Micah and I have been involved with, I think, mm-hmm. basically since its inception. Right. Um, so Set Apart to Serve was created after the 2019 convention. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. In 2019, I was just coming on as associate provost, and I remember this, this statistic from um, the, the Synod workbook uh, that... that uh, pastoral education numbers, especially here at Concordia Seminary from 2004 to 2019, um, had pretty dramatically decreased. And right. we said, hey, we really need to um, we really need to turn this around. I think 61% That's was what it was. And, and uh, the Concordia University system pre-seminary programs we're also down about 59% yep. or so. That's right. Uh, and these were like alarm bells going off. And there were lots of good people working on it at the time and and uh, and such. Uh, it wasn't like everybody was asleep at the right. at the wheel. But, but uh, it was kind of a wake-up moment for our entire church body to say, hey, we really need uh, to put extra effort into this. And so uh, this church worker recruitment initiative kind of got started. Right. Uh, So tell us a little bit about... Well, before we jump into that, because that's going to take us a a long time to talk about (laughs) and talk about our work, and we'll get trapped. Uh, Because something we like to do, Jim, is ask our guests, how did you get into church work? Because, you know, as you know, in your work, stories matter, and your story resonates with somebody, my story resonates with somebody. So it's just nice to, to share and give our audience an idea about who you are. And so if you don't mind, um, something we also don't typically do, but we want to ask you as well, if you don't mind sharing your route to ministry, but then also perhaps share a little bit about your career before you became the executive director for pastoral education. Sure. <clears throat> I don't have a dramatic story as to how I got into the ministry. Uh, however, uh, 
with our research, it's probably the most typical way. Sure. Uh, I was raised in a Lutheran church, um, and uh, my parents um, were strong advocates of their children, five of us, uh, going to church every Sunday. Um, and so our Savior Lutheran Church in Green Bay, Wisconsin is where I uh, was raised, went to Sunday school, went to VBS, was in the choir. Uh, I'm a music major in, uh, at Concordia St. Paul, uh, from Concordia St. Paul, and so I loved watching the organist play, and we got a, um, uh, we had a pipe organ, and I just loved the pipe organ. And so it was just uh, being a part of the congregation and my parents thinking and knowing that the Christian faith was important for their children. Um, when I was about junior in high school, I thought, well, I, I kind of like this church work thing. I think I'll be a missionary. And then I thought, no, I think I want to be a Lutheran school teacher. And then it was my home pastor uh, who said, uh, I think you should consider the pastoral ministry. And that's all it took. And okay, uh, I'll do that. And uh, where do I go? And um, being in Green Bay, Milwaukee probably would have been the most likely choice. But that was a two-year school at the time, way back then. Yes, sir. And uh, and two of my children graduated from there since then. But <clears throat> uh, my home pastor said, "Go to Concordia St. Paul." And uh, so that's where I went. I was a music major, um, pre-seminary studies, of course. Met my wife there as well. She's a Lutheran school teacher to this very day. Um, then after that, I went um, to um, the seminary in Fort Wayne. I graduated there in 87. And then uh, first call was in central Minnesota, Kimball, for about five years. My next call was 16 years in Mandan, North Dakota. I was elected district president. I uh, was district president for about eight years. Um, term limits was nine. <laughs> and so uh, I was called uh, to this position now at the International Center. Sure. That's all good stuff. Yeah, it's, it's one of these things, um, you know, as I go about and do my work uh, for recruiting, talking to middle schoolers, talking to high schoolers, and even college-age students, second career it doesn't matter. I asked that same question as, has anybody ever encouraged you or said, should you consider church work? Um, I'm often a little taken aback by the response because it's, it's not what you would expect yeah. sometimes. The number's a little low. And so that's when I, you know, I talk to influencers, teachers and stuff like that. Just, just start asking the kids because right. if we don't start asking them young, they'll never consider it. I mean, how could they if they don't know? I mean, sure, they see their pastor, they see their teacher, but uh, in all of like their assessments that are taken in school, when they get the results, Lutheran teacher and pastor are not on the PSAT list. It's doctor, right. lawyer, or something else. That's so they right. get in their mind, these are talents that I have, so I'm going to pursue this. And they don't even think that they might have a career in church work. But then when I say that, I'm always taken back again by the questions that, students ask because they ask things like was well, it difficult and that opens right. up a window to talk about the challenges and the joys and the joys and the challenges of church work right. and then they get interested i invite them to vocatio it grows and we see how it goes yeah yeah very good so you had mentioned that i work for a set of parts serve that's about 80 percent of my time right now I yeah. Yeah. yeah i didn't yeah. mention that because <laughs> right. we were going to get to right. it um, so um, we've, we've hired or called other people to do some other things that I was doing before. And what you had just said, um, we did some pretty major research at the beginning of Set Apart to Serve. Right. And a couple of things that came out of that was, um, when was the time you were most influenced uh, to consider church work? And you said it earlier, about seventh and eighth grade is kind of the sweet spot. Many times because that's the time of catechism instruction. And our outside Missouri Synod researchers um, were kind of amazed by that because um, church worker after church worker said to them, uh, it, well, it was catechism instruction with my pastor or my DCE or you know, somebody who was teaching them. The other thing we had learned, what you just said a few minutes ago, is about 50% of, only about 50% of our current church workers are encouraging or saying anything at all to our youth about considering church work. 
there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one is they're just not thinking about it. Um, secondly, there might, there might be some things going on in their own life and in their own vocation as pastor teacher that says, yeah, I don't think I want youth to, to do that sort of thing. Um, so we're addressing that, by the way. And, uh, and, um, and so intentional is just extremely important, that uh, we want our church workers, parents, and others uh, to be intentional about talking to our youth about considering church work. And then the influencers, which you mentioned earlier, our research also said there are four primary influential adult groups uh, that have encouraged them to consider church work. Number one is still pastor. Um, number two is parents. Three is all the other church work or are all the other church workers, the, the uh, commissioned workers, DCEs, teachers, deaconesses, and so on. And four is actually the congregation, the members, the laity, um, seeing something in these youth that says, "Hey, you should consider church work." So sure. I mean, yeah. So for my my story, uh, <clears throat> the first time I ever considered it, I went to Luther North here in town. Our campus pastor, Mike Maskey, who's now sainted, was just a great campus pastor, very challenging um, in all the right ways, was a football coach, believed me in football. But then the spark that actually got me to pursue it was a little old lady named Roya, Moira, Myra, sorry, who was watching me teach uh, Sunday school to junior schoolers and high schoolers. And she said, hey, you're, you're kind of taking a break from college. Have you ever thought about being a youth pastor? And I was like, huh. Because I love, I love teaching yeah. um, more than most things. And people always ask me, what's my favorite thing to do as a pastor? That's something youth ask me. I say, most guys, it feels like you're meant to say preaching. Because like, yeah. that's the thing that everybody watches you do. And everybody wants to be a great preacher. But I actually prefer teaching. And I actually really prefer teaching confirmation age students. So it, it, just the variety. And again, it's, they just don't know all of what church work entails as a pastor, deaconess, DCE, or teacher and beyond. And so it's just, that's, I think that's part of what I have really enjoyed about Set Apart to Serve, because it's, it's the statistics, it's the market research, but it's also the, it, it, like this never-ending pamphlet of opportunity that we're presenting to people in our church and say, this is what a church looker, worker might usually look like but this is also what it can look like and i think that's something that also might have been missing in the past yeah that makes me think of a story i i presented in front of youth lead um a bunch of um youth about junior or senior high school level and uh, this is like two or three years ago so we we've been learning about set apart to serve by having all these conversations and i was in front of the youth lead there were about 80 kids there and i said you know have you ever considered church work and i was going on for about five minutes and one a senior high boy raises his hand and says you keep saying church work but besides pastor what are you talking about <laughs> and i thought okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're doing something wrong here and uh so i went so we went back and we're really helping youth and the church itself uh, understand that there are actually eight vocations, yeah. full-time vocations uh, in which they can serve uh, in the church. Uh, we call them uh, ordained vocation and then commissioned. Um, our church body calls them that. So the, all the commissioned are, you know, like Lutheran school teacher, deaconess, director of Christian education, director of family life ministry, director of parish music, director of outreach, uh, and director of church ministries. Um, and then certainly the pastor as well. And so the youth who are in maybe a rural setting or where they don't have a Lutheran school, they didn't realize, um, oh, you know, we have, we have DCEs or we have Lutheran school teachers. I could be one of those. And um, we're right now we're, we can come back to this later, but we're working on a curriculum with Concordia Publishing House. And over and over, we're driving home those eight areas and, and trying to get our children uh, to know that, hey, these are ways I can serve in the church full time. Well, one of the one of the uh, main uh, audiences uh, that that listen and or watch this this podcast are people who I think are somewhere on the fence thinking about this. They're they've they've maybe started down the process, but they're still gathering a lot of information. And um, one thing that I I think is really helpful um, 
is to paint the 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 actual picture of what's going on in the church and not to paint it for dire purposes to wring our hands or to say all hope is lost because Jesus is risen from the dead all hope isn't lost but uh, sometimes it's 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 actually quite helpful and we've had several students come to the seminary because they realize the actual state of the need for uh, pastors and church workers. So um, I, I want to dive into this, not to be depressing, but rather to kind of raise the um, raise the awareness even more among our, our listeners and, and viewers about where the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod is with our church worker um, shortage. So can we talk a little bit about that? Has, has Set Apart to Serve done any... Uh, any data mining? Are there statistics that we have about uh, pastors that are retiring or how many we need in order to fill vacant pulpits? Right. So <clears throat> my mind just went a hundred directions when you started <laughs> yeah, talking. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of different ways to go. And I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tossing you a softball so that hopefully uh, wherever it comes in, you can, you can hit it. We have one set of statistics um, that says, uh, the pastors that are retiring and dying, because there's this large baby boomer population that yeah. actually is moving up and getting elderly and dying, um, uh, is about twice as many as the number of new seminary graduates each spring. Wow. So that's about, that's your 50%, or you said 59 earlier, you know, we're kind of in that squishy uh, area. So that is true. Um, where my mind was going is uh, there's been some um, chatter on Facebook lately uh, that says maybe we don't need all those pastors. Mm. And, uh, and um, my response to that is we do. Um, because even though there might be some areas in the nation or internationally where churches might be closing, getting smaller, um, merging, there are also major areas, especially in our cities, where there's a need for more pastors. Yeah. And um, also, um, I also, uh, I've had this conversation with district presidents as well, and, and they, they understand this well, is that look at the neighborhoods in our, where our churches are, Hmong neighborhoods, um, um, uh, Hispanic neighborhoods, uh, neighbor, uh, uh, Chinese neighborhoods, where um, they don't necessarily have the gospel, and it's not being preached to them, and no one's going to them. And so whether it be the seminaries or the church body itself, we have to figure out how to raise up pastors um, who will go into those areas. There's a great need. There's, I just did this... Um, research the other day, and I can't remember the numbers, but it's millions of people in the United States who do not believe in Jesus Christ or do not know him. And so for us to say, well, maybe we don't need pastors, we definitely do, uh, because there's always going to be sin and there's always going to be uh, unbelief. I, yeah, I, as I go about my work, I always respond the same way. People are like, well, do we need pastors in all of the congregations that we currently have? Can those congregations afford pastors, all this? And I'm like, well, first of all, that's not really the question at hand. And that's irrelevant that's right. because even if they can't afford a pastor, they still need the gospel. They need to receive the sacraments. They need to be a part of the body. And we need to figure out a way to do that. We have some things, S&P does that a little bit. Uh, well, actually, it does it greatly. Um, but kind of moving on, and I answer the same way. It's like, okay, like so rural areas of, of the country aren't as populated as they used to be, but what about the cities, and what about our stakehold in major cities around the country? We, we can do better. We have some. Right. But exactly, we, we need to be better in cities of millions of people. We'll, right. we'll never have enough pastors to serve everybody. And internationally as well. 100%. Our international Office of International Mission right now needs 140 brand new um, international missionaries in the next, I think, three years, they're saying. Okay. I mean, that's a lot. Yes. Um, and is, it, is this about right that, uh, so the seminaries are roughly speaking in a 
we, we just brought in our new class. Roughly speaking, the two seminaries combined brought in 100 new students. That's give or take about what we're, what we're graduating right now. Um, we need basically another 100 um, in order to just keep up with um, those that are, are retiring or leaving the, the office. That's right. It may not look the way it looked in the 1950s or 80s or 90s, but uh, we certainly definitely do uh, need new pastors. And and I I think we're seeing some glimmers, aren't we? Um, I mean, the seminary enrollment is up, Fort Wayne, it's not massive yet, um, but um, I'm very hopeful. I think um, we're going to see some continued increases. Uh, Our Concordia universities, the enrollments are up for church work programs this past year. So. Yeah, very much so. We we just had our, our admissions officers, Jesse Keeker and Tom Schlund, come back from visiting Concordia's. And one of the things that I'm always interested in their visits is what's the freshman class look like? Because uh, this isn't a it, it won't probably stay the same. Uh, most of the Concordia's actually grow their pre-seminary enrollment as they go because right. they grab additional guys into pre-sem, they grab additional gals to be teachers and um, and such. But but this year's freshman class uh, across the board among the Concordia's was was up pretty su- substantially actually. Right. Um, and and I think there's. There are a lot of people uh, in our church body, across our church body, with a lot of uh, oars in the water trying to do what they can. So different Concordias are offering different scholarships and this sort of thing. That's partly uh, helping getting the word out, um, raising people's imagination. So where does um, where does Set Apart to Serve go from here? We've had um, we've we've had. We've done some market research. We've talked with youth. We've talked with pastors and and uh, commission ministers, uh, laity. Uh, we've we've begun to do some. You talked about the curriculum that's being developed with Concordia Publishing House. What are some other tangible ways that Set Apart to Serve is uh, kind of saying in the next you know couple of years? Here's here's where we're headed. Here's what Set Apart to Serve is aiming to accomplish. And I. I say that uh, knowing some of the answers, but I'm asking for our, for our listeners. So uh, one major milestone that just took place was the town hall. Mm-hmm. And uh, the town hall was a culmination of a pilot project. Um, all 35 districts participated in this pilot project where um, we tested resources, um, where they told us what was going well, what's not going well, what works, what doesn't work, with all these resources that we put together. Resources like uh, journey maps for youth. When are the, uh, what are milestones in the youth's life where we may connect with them to talk about church work? Um, uh, FAQs, um, how do I begin the conversation with um, a preschooler <laughs> or a middle age, uh, I mean, a middle school child or a high school child? Um, where, are, where are the um, universities where they can go and what, what's the tuition and all that? So we put all those resources together, we fine tuned them, made them look really nice uh, through um, uh, marketing and communications. Um, and um, we put those now fully online uh, as of September 27. And uh, so if one were to go to the uh, Set Apart to Serve um, uh, webpage, you're going to find umpteen resources right now. So that's pretty major. And those resources are geared toward the major influencers. There's a whole section for pastors, a whole section for church commission workers. Some of them are the same, but um, still designed specifically. Some for parents and some for laity. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, that's something that just majorly happened. Uh, Set Apart to Serve is also moving in, I'll come back to the youth one, but second career. Um, the Schwann Foundation, the ice cream people, um, have gifted us greatly, like three quarters of a million dollars uh, to help fund Set Apart to Serve. And uh, they came back to us a year or two ago and said, um, you're doing this youth phase, which was the 2019 convention resolution that you mentioned. How about second career adults uh, in our congregations and schools? And we said, we want to get there, but one, we don't have the funding, and two, um, 
we're just not ready. And they said, well, we'll give you $150,000 if you go start now. <laughs> and so we did. And of course, the seminaries are major players in the second career. We, you know, for the audience, we've been working um, uh, together collaboratively yeah. Yeah. right from the ground up. Um, also, a colloquy, first vice president and uh, synod and um, LCMS school ministry. So uh, we did a major research project, about $90,000 worth, um, uh, researching our second career workers, saying what got you into uh, considering uh, ministry, whether it be pastor or teacher. Those are the two main ones that we're working with, second career. Um, how do I colloquize into them? So <clears throat> now we're putting together, so the next step is putting together a plan now, resources for congregations working with second career individuals. Um, so, um, and then also uh, we've got this kind of international phase that's starting. Uh, our international church partners are asking us, um, tell us more about what you guys are doing um, because we have the same issues. So for instance, later this month I'm going to Asia and uh, giving presentations to our church partners in Asia about what we're doing. Um, and I mean, this is a worldwide thing. We want the gospel to go worldwide. Uh, Latvia has asked for, for it as well. At the same time, we're working with um, this group called Standing Partnership. They're a communications and marketing firm in St. Louis. Um, the Synod has invested like $1.2 million into this marketing and research, I mean, a marketing and communications firm. Um, and uh, they have just been remarkable in leading us and helping us guide and lead us. The reason I mention that is right now we're working on like another $500,000 um, statement of work with them because we say that church worker recruitment um, should take place from now actually it took place from the time Christ uh, said the workers are few, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, until the Lord returns. Right. And so set apart to serve is not a gimmick. It's not a three year, you know, flash in the pan. Um, this is something we will continue to do. And so we're working with how do we move forward now uh, with set apart to serve? What new resources do we need to put together? What new research do we need to work on? How do we build out the leadership uh, of Set Apart to Serve, a succession plan um, so that it continues uh, to move forward um, with the youth phase, with the second career? Um, how do we continue the great collaboration, which you kind of touched on earlier, the role of the yeah, oars in yeah. the water? Set Apart to Serve has a collaboration of almost every major entity in the Synod that you can think of. The seminaries, highly collaborative, the Concordia Universities. I mean, just look at what Dr. Bull and Dr. Dawn and Friedrich are writing about, you know, and not that they necessarily mention Set Apart to Serve, but church worker recruitment um, and uh, formation. All 35 district presidents uh, are on board. Uh, Lutheran Church Extension Fund, Concordia Publishing House, Higher Things. You mentioned Christ Academy and Vocatio. And uh, I mean, you just go across the board. Uh, LWML just uh, gave $100,000 at their last convention to set apart to serve or committed when the mites come in. Um, we're like 10th on the project list. So, um, so that's that's kind of where we're moving forward. It's not done. We have a lot, a lot of work, a lot of work to do, and it's exciting. Actually, it's kind of it's kind of fun working with you guys, um, working with all those entities, saying we got a common cause here, and it's the it's the proclamation of the gospel. That's yeah. what drives um, church worker formation recruitment. And I, I think that's been a a, a good thing uh, that I've I've heard from. Um, our, you know, our graduates and those that are sending us students, um, they're actually really encouraged to see that the two seminaries are working together. And not only that, but we're working with Synod. So um, we have this, this uh, website, weareyourseminaries.org, weareyourseminaries.org. And uh, people, if they go out to that website, they would see Set Apart to Serve, they would see Concordia Seminary St. Louis. They would see Concordia Theological Seminary Fort Wayne. And we, we actually jointly built that website. Uh, you, you, 
you know the amount of emails that got yes. exchanged back and forth yeah. uh, as we were working on that. So there, there really has been this um, where we we seek to uh, have this rising tide that lifts all boats, and we're not we're not in this uh, competition where we're fighting for the last piece of pie. That's the wrong analogy for where um, the entities of our of our church body are. Well, and I, I agree, <clears throat> not just a set apart to serve, but when I, when I go out and make presentations, I, I always say, you should see how these two seminaries get along. Um, the provost meeting together, the president's meeting together, vicarage supervisors, um, admissions counselors. Uh, um, I, I think it's fantastic. It, it really is. Well, it, just even the, the depths to where we, we look to collaborate across the board. So you, you mentioned Youth Lead with Juliana Schultz. Not that mm -hmm. long ago, I was on a call with her and uh, the youth department. From, from the LCMS talking about Youth Lead and hearing about Juliana's work. And she started to do satellite Youth Leads because Youth Lead takes place in Missouri, but how do right. we help other districts? And something that uh, both Matt Wheatfeld, Pastor Matt Wheatfeld, my counterpart at, well, our counterpart at, at Fort Wayne with Christ Academy, I've been asked to do satellite vocatios. Yeah. Well, part of vocatio is is being in this incredible place. And I, I can't pick up the seminary and, and take it to a coast. I would if I could, but but that's such a big part of it. But we, we've been on email chains and calls together and say, well, okay, so it's hard to do a satellite vocatio on my own, but what if we took pieces of vocatio and, and the best pieces of Christ Academy and the best pieces of Youth Lead and we try to package them together what might that look like? And we haven't come to a conclusion yet, but just those conversations and those those creative ideas of trying to come together and say, again, it's not about either seminary, it's not a particular CUS school, it's not just about Synod's initiative versus our initiatives, but it's a church body moving together for the same goal. And in my life of the LCMS, I mean, we're not perfectly unified in everything, sure. just like any group of people, but when it comes to church worker recruitment, so I've been in my role now for almost four years, I don't, I don't I can't recall any one effort on the the church has put forward in my lifetime that has had so much momentum but also so much collaboration. Right. And I think that's it's great to be a part of it, but also just for the sake of the church. You know, I have three young children. They're going to need pastors. One of them particularly might end up being one. I, they great. both have this stuff. My youngest, I I see him and I'm like, "Man, this kid we were at, anyway recently when he was asked what he wants to be his teacher. I'm all for that too, but but it's just one of these things where uh, this this collaboration and it's not only is it helpful but it's noticeable, and I think that is playing a big role in in people saying okay, if if everybody's on board, I might as well get on board with it too. I mean, you I can find the things wrong with everything if you want to. You could find ways and reasons not to participate, but I'm finding less and less of that these days than maybe before we all started collaborating together. And I think that's great. You mentioned something like that made me think of something is when we first, even before Set Apart to Serve had a name, um, this whole thing started um, with a grant uh, and we brought together uh, the seminary presidents and uh, some of the CUS presidents who were forming the most, sending out the most church workers. And uh, the question at that time, it was about pastoral formation, by the way, that meeting was, was uh, scheduled, uh, uh, the goal of it. And I went around, it was uh, Dale Meyer at the time, and Rast, and Harrison, and, and uh, Friedrich, and Gard, and I'm missing someone. Um, there was another one, sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, Ferry, Dr. Ferry uh, from uh, Concordia, Wisconsin. And I, I just said, um, you guys have invested a lot of time into helping prepare men for the ministry. Um, it's, it's borne some crosses. Uh, it's not always been easy. Why do you do it? I mean, why do you spend these years and years doing it? They went around the table, and this is something you kind of just said a minute ago. Their answer was because we want our children and grandchildren, our family, friends, and the world to know about Jesus Christ and have forgiveness of sin and eternal life, that one day we'll all be together in heaven. Set Apart to Serve is a collaborative effort. No one, no one owns it, and we're all doing this together um, and uh, for that very purpose. 
uh, so that our children, grandchildren in the world know Jesus Christ and him crucified for, for eternal salvation. And that's why we're doing it together. Uh, I love that. And uh, I don't want to jump away from that too quickly because that is such a, um, a beautiful thing just to hang out there. Uh, what a, you know, when, when Jesus called us to take the gospel to all nations, talk about a vision, talk about a, a major uh, commission uh, that he sent us out with. And, um, uh, but, but I had a question cooking in my mind as this conversation was going along. So uh, it's a little more practical. Uh, we just had a synodical convention this summer, just uh, uh, not too long ago. Uh, and uh, I know that Set Apart to Serve was a topic at convention. Can you bring, can you kind of update listeners and viewers on uh, what was said about Set Apart to Serve? What, what, uh, what did the convention, um, were there decisions that were made that impact uh, the future of Set Apart to Serve? Um, what did, what did uh, Synod and Convention have to say about all this? Well, um, I think uh, some of the main things that happened at convention was one um, was uh, at on the floor of the convention, we had all worked together to put together four videos. Now, uh, time to get time on the convention floor is pretty monumental yeah, yeah. <laughs> because every minute counts, right? And um, uh, we were able to do four videos highlighting four different vocations, pastoral, teacher, deaconess, and, and all the other ones together. And each video was about three minutes long. And uh, when I watched those, and when they were done on the floor with before our delegates, there was applause. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the applause was, um, what I sensed was, these are our church workers. Um, this is the need for the gospel to be preached and taught from the pulpit, from our classrooms. So I think one great thing was is our people showing appreciation for their church workers and knowing the need for them. Uh, another thing was, you know, in the um, display area, uh, the exhibit hall, um, we had all worked together, set apart to serve, uh, the International Center people, the seminaries, and then the Concordia universities. And we had agreed that we're all going to be right in the same proximity and so, especially Set Apart to Serve, Glenn Rollins, I mentioned him, he works for Set Apart to Serve. Depending upon the question, we'd say, you got to go talk to the seminaries if you're interested in um, being a seminarian, being a pastor or deaconess, or, or you got to go and talk to the Concordias. And they were right there, and we even had stickers on the floor that directed, you know, people right there. People noticed that, that we were working all together, um, and so I think that was fabulous. We had a resolution 601, um, which came right out of the first out of the gate in um, in the uh, floor committee for seminaries. Um, we didn't have anything really super new. Um, what we wanted to do was say was to highlight uh, our work together and to say let's continue to do it. Yeah. Um, and we asked that every entity, every congregation, every school. Uh, be a part of Set Apart to Serve in the sense of encouraging young people uh, to con and, and adults uh, to consider uh, a church work uh, vocation. We also said the new curriculum that's coming out of CPH, um, which I should put a plug in for LCEF, uh, LCEF gave like $200,000, and then each of the Concordias kicked, uh, kicked in about $5,000 each. When the curriculum's done in the spring, it will go to every Lutheran school at absolutely no cost. Uh, that was LCEF who wanted that to happen. Um, that's and, no small. That's no small feat. No, it's um, not. Six thousand congregations that's or so, right. and uh, and to to ship this. I'm, exactly I'm right. guessing that it's not just uh, a single slip of paper that you can just put in a, in an envelope. Uh, there's there's going to be... It's pretty major. As yeah. a matter of fact, there's four, if we have the time for it, we have four topics. Uh, what is the church? Um, who are our LCMS church workers? Uh, how do we care for our church workers? And then how do we develop a culture, church work formation, recruitment in our congregations and schools? Mm -hmm. 
that'll be age appropriate for various levels, uh, you know, of age. Um, and um, so, uh, actually, um, uh, Jacob Corzine and I are meeting this afternoon, just going nice. over some of the first units that they're they're putting out uh, that they're working on. So that's fantastic. Do we? Is there a, a an end date yet of when you think that that might be ready? A ballpark or it's am looking I you on no, spot? it's looking spring of twenty twenty four. Okay. We're hoping okay. that uh, it's in the hands of um, uh, our schools by you know the fall. Court. Yep, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. It's it's um I've been paying attention to uh, the details of of this. I I remember when I was a pastor, uh, what a way came out. Uh, I think that was maybe two thousand four, two thousand five, right. six, something like that. And I remember as a as a church worker. Uh, as a new pastor, saying to our our uh, elementary school, our Lutheran elementary school, uh, where I was serving, hey, I really would like to see this uh, get get implemented in right. our classrooms. How, and we actually met together as pastors and teachers to talk about what what will it look like to uh, to get this curriculum going. Um, and there were there were all kinds of creative things. And I I think this. To me, as I've watched all the different people that are involved, and I've heard some of the names behind the scenes of, that are working on it and writing it, uh, it's it's a major undertaking, and it's not a quick slap something together. Right. Let's That's rebrand right. or repurpose a nice Bible study that was written in 1975. Um, not that there was anything wrong with that. That's right. But 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 this is a fully all newly fully written. new yeah. newly written um, specifically for. 2023, 2024. Right. Uh, that's really, really exciting. Yeah. Nice. Uh, just, just for a snippet of content, um, because we can just to stay on the, the practicality train, because we talked about the passion of, of people in our congregations, our passion for our kids and, and the like. Uh, something that I've found in Vocatio, uh, which has been a blessing to see it grow. I saw on a graph the, the vocatio growth over the last four years on a, for the first time. And for me, I, I'm just doing it. Kids show up. But, but this last summer we had unavoidable, sorry, I'm the one. Um, we had nearly 70 youth come, which right. more than doubled what we had even last summer, which nearly doubled what I had the summer before. My granddaughter was one of them. It, 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 <laughs> it's, um, uh, I'm trying Annie. To, Annie, yes. She came up and had some great questions oh, for me yeah. after, <laughs> she after was, a devotion that I well, did. And I was talking to your son. I was like, yeah. well, now that you're here, you might as well give it a look around and, and right. think about it. Uh, yeah. She was a wonderful young woman. I hope she comes back. Um, but these these young people, they're coming to the seminary, spending a week with us. It's in the advertising. This is a church work thing. It's not required that you're already thinking about it. I right. ask those questions. But, but they come knowing that that's what we're talking about. Right. Um, so they're they're serious about the church, and something I've begun to ask them. I'm like, okay, like you you plan to stay in the church, right? Yes. You, you maybe plan to get married, have kids someday, right? Yes. And then I say, well, who's going to be their pastor, or their teacher? Right. And then I, you know, I put some of the, I try to instill some of the passion onto them as well, and some of the ownership that you know, if, if this is going to, it will continue because Jesus is Lord, but but everybody has to play their part. Not everybody's going to be a pastor. Not everybody's going to be a teacher because not everyone's called to. Right. But if you're sitting there and we're talking about this work and we're saying, like, these are some other gifts and skills that go into it, and you, you're looking at yourself, and I, I have some of those, you should be seriously considering it because the Spirit might be tapping you on the shoulder and, and leading you and guiding you towards it. Uh, not to give any part of the curriculum, but is this part of some of the content as, uh, that as Set Apart to Serve has been thinking about and putting together? Most definitely, yeah. yeah. And also it made me think of, um, you know, a number of youth will ask me, what should I be doing now? Um, whether, they're, whether they're fourth graders or eighth graders or 12th graders. And <clears throat> again, our research said, um, the things that they should be doing now is one, continue to be in the divine service, right? Um, worship weekly, uh, being fed by the Lord's word and sacraments. Um, uh, youth who are very interested in um, um, 
the church, uh, Bible study, or just being at church or serving um, in any way. We we have some um, graphics that talk about, you know, being in divine service, um, being um, uh, a servant of the church, and all the way from preschool, helping with chairs or picking up food or, you know, whatever it is, all the way up to the servant event of, of high schoolers uh, and so on. Um, be a good student um, and uh, just uh, in, in your regular academics because it does take a lot of work uh, to be a church worker. We, we, put, our, we put our students uh, through the paces um, and rightfully so, uh, right? So those are some of the things that we encourage and we do have them think about the future as well. Like you just said, you know, who, who will feed you um, and who will be your pastor? And we even kind of say like, you know, if you're going through, God forbid, a marriage crisis um, or um, um, uh, a miscarriage um, or your parents die, who, who's going to be there to give that pastoral care to you or the teacher that comes beside you and, and gives you? They don't just teach math. Uh, they, you know, they, they give spiritual care uh, as well. So. Well, we could continue to dive into it uh, because, again, the the overlap between our work is so deep. Uh, so we'll just have to have you come back on maybe quarterly just to give That'd be great. part to serve updates and we can continue to chat on all this. But uh, time constraints, giving Dale a layup and not giving him too much work and post editing and things like that. We try to think about Dale, not too hard, but, all right. but we try to think about Dale uh, after each episode and during each episode. Uh, but we're going to, we have a segment called Right for the Pickin'. Leave it on the tree, right along with the, the name of the podcast, Under the Fig Tree, where uh, it's the most objective, so therefore the most important part of the podcast, where Ben and I have random, well, I have a running list. I don't know what Ben has going on, but I have a running list of, of random things to ask you about. And if you like it, it's right for the pickin'. If you don't like it, you leave it on the tree. And uh, yeah, we, we just go back and forth and we'll see how it goes. All right. So. I'll, Go for I'll, it. Yeah, I'll start with it. Uh, a heads up, probably 80% of these have to deal with food. I don't know why. It's just the way it is. Uh, but right for the pick-in, leave it on the tree. Chunky applesauce. Oh, no, I don't like chunky applesauce. <laughs> yeah, I, I, like, I like the smooth. The smooth stuff? Yeah. yeah. Chunky applesauce. I, I, don't, I don't, can you even, can you buy chunky applesauce? I don't know. If, I'm sure there's a store that'll sell it, but usually I you get in like restaurants. I'm thinking like old country buffet or something like that. They so, may, yeah. so I'm. This takes me back. You took me back to that my, a childhood moment. Okay. Do you remember uh, in in um, Ratatouille, the movie Ratatouille, um, Vigo, the the um, the food critic, yeah. he takes a bite and he's like transported back to his childhood. Um, when you asked about chunky applesauce, you, you transported me back to my childhood. My Aunt Judy, uh, who is now with Jesus in heaven, uh, she made the world's best chunky applesauce. Oh. And, I mean, this was, this was a, a farmer's wife that was just loved to cook, loved, loved to—she was my sponsor, my baptismal sponsor— and she loved to show me the love of Jesus by providing really good eats. Mm. And she made this fantastic chunky applesauce. I have not thought about chunky applesauce in, I don't know, 35 years probably. That's what I'm here for. Yeah. Maybe Thank if you. I had hers, I'd like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I w I w so I was going to say, like, for me, it's hit or miss because it, it can be yeah. really bad. I mean, even smooth applesauce can be bad. I I like the idea of it, and I've had some good ones. I would yeah. have loved to try yeah. Judy's because now you've made it sound divine. Oh. Um, we don't like to sit on the fence here. So I'll say right for the picking, but it has to be – like all food, you can say all these things, but it does have to be good. But in, in If we're talking Cracker Barrel, Chunky uh, – the the apples that's just straight out of a can like man is it scream factory and then it's just oh, <laughs> well, well disgusting. not only that I've it's had also it cloying sweet where people will leave the peel on the apple disgusting yeah that that, that makes it so weird yeah and Judy always peel their apples well there we there, there we go <laughs> yeah, all right yeah, yeah. all right ripe for the picking or leave it on the tree I don't know exactly when this episode will air but 
I think we're we're around the the season a little bit before a little bit after um, these little candy bright orange with a little green stem candy pumpkins mm. right for the picking or leave it on the tree fully sugar right uh, just plain probably not so much but to have them with like uh, salted peanuts oh mm. oh that's pretty good yeah it's it's leave it on the tree for me uh, <laughs> i've 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 heard about this mixing it with the salty food yeah uh, i i don't think that i can that's be not you, convinced right? um they they just don't taste like anything it's just i think you're right it's, it's pure sugar, sugar, it's sugar yeah. and lots of food coloring yeah well that'll so, turn you into a superhero maybe <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Micah's got a sweet tooth, though. I know that. Uh, so, so I when I think about those little candy pumpkins, they're just like candy corn. I think yeah. they're exactly the same. Maybe some artificial flavor here or there. So on their own, I would say leave it on the tree for oh. both. With, without a question, just because, anyway, for lots of different reasons. But the way you talked about it, because I've had candy corn in like a trail mix. Well, you start mixing it up with some stuff and you add some texture to it, some different flavors. Now it's a part, of, it's a different thing, but in that thing, it's nice. So if it were mixed around anything, I'm 100% with you. On their own, leave it on the tree. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Yeah. All right. Uh, right for the picking, leave it on the tree. DIY projects. Uh, leave that one on the okay. tree. Everything that I touch, <laughs> I have to call like the plumber <laughs> or the electrician. <laughs> And my wife would even be stronger about this. Yeah, don't let Jim uh, do any DIYs. <laughs> I, um, I, it, it depends on what it is. So if, if it's home improvement projects, um, it's, it's absolutely leave it on the tree. It's called my dad. He's construction, was in construction, carpentry his whole uh, career. Mm. Dad will come and he'll make whatever um, I've broken or made look awful. He'll make it look fantastic and uh, he'll fix it. Or my father-in-law is a mechanic. And so uh, for years he would work on all of our vehicles. So any of those kind of DIY projects, absolute no. When it comes to like brewing things or venting things, yeah, I'm, that's, I'm all, all about, or food DIY food projects. I made I made miso. So I'm just gonna miso pause you for a second. When I was talking about, when I said DIY, it had nothing to do with food. It had everything to do with the things you said you don't. Want. I was gonna say, how did you get to yeah. food? <laughs> I'm not gonna let you steal my my DIY right for the DIY. Pick I don't know. Make your own miso. That's a pretty serious project. It's not DIY. It's cooking. And brewing is also cooking slash chemistry. All right. All right. All right. Then it's then it's fully leave it on the tree for me. Sure. Uh, it's it's right for the picking for me and it's when when i got my first call we bought a house that wasn't in like disrepair but it had been like a house that was like rented for years and years and years so we got it under the market but also things quickly began to break or fall apart and right out of the seminary you got to be very careful about how you spend your money it's like okay so i buy something cheap and then have somebody come install it for me, or do I take that money, buy the better product, and learn how to install it myself? And uh, I'll never forget, one year, our air conditioner went out, which I couldn't fix, and it was like the end of September, and I decided not to fix it. I was like, it'll, it'll cool off soon. It didn't cool off till November, or anyway. <laughs> but we were too deep in, where I was like, we're just gonna ride this thing out until next spring. Uh, so the air conditioner went out, my wife's car broke down, like the alternator, broke and it was like a thousand dollars on a van that had almost 400,000 miles and the garage door opener broke so didn't fix the AC bought a new van and so I replaced the garage door opener and then the YouTube video that was three minutes long it said this is like an hour and a half long project well five hours after I began I finally finished it installed it had the lasers pointed the right way and then it gave me the the courage and thought that I could do it all. So I, we don't do it here at the seminary because we're not allowed to mainly, but also we don't have to. So I have like a little woodworking spot in the basement to satisfy that need. Cause I just enjoy working with my hands I found. Well, anyway, so it's right for the picking. All right. <laughs> it has nothing to do with food. <laughs> Although you like, 
you like to cook too. You're yeah, 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 I'm big time. Yeah, yeah love food. Yeah. <laughs> All right, maybe last one for me. Right for the picking or leave it on the tree. Uh, the Charlie Brown special. So Great Pumpkin or uh, Charlie Brown's Christmas. Um, right for the picking, leave it on the tree. Oh, I love Charlie Brown. I grew up waiting. This was before DVD or right, uh, right, right. Uh, and uh, you waited every year for that special to come on, right? And uh, love them all. Wow. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that I've ever watched, um, sat down and watched any of those straight through from beginning to end because inevitably, you would you would have it on the calendar. We, you'd like you know you'd have to get either in the 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 newspaper or the TV guide, yeah. you'd find yeah. out when is it coming on. And like, sometimes we'd even put this on the calendar, but inevitably we would forget about it. We'd be out playing with friends. And so, you know, you'd watch the last 10 minutes and, and then you'd wait for it to come on for an entire year. I was explaining this to mm. my kids and they're like, well, why, why wouldn't you, why couldn't you just rent it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. where are you going to do that? Yeah. Um, even before, VCRs That's and all right. this kind of stuff. Uh, man, when CBS played it, you watched it. And you if did. they didn't play it, you didn't watch it. Yep. I would say, though, for me, I'm going to leave it on the tree. Mm. I I like a lot of the, the specials, but Charlie Brown never never quite... It, it was, I was always a little... I don't know if I was bored by it, or maybe it was the teacher, wah, 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 wah. wah, wah. wah, wah, wah. Uh, it's yeah. classic, but... Uh, I think I'll leave it on the tree. Uh, it's it's right for the picking for me. I was blessed to be born when VHS was a thing. And there was the special where it's like Charlie Brown and they go study abroad. Hmm. I, I can't, I rem I, I can't remember like the title of it, but they're like they go to France. Uh, and I, I watched that thing until the VHS stopped working. <laughs> I, I love Charlie Brown. I played uh, Schroeder in yeah, the play yeah. once. Yeah. yeah, big fan of Charlie Brown. Love it. Nice. It's good stuff. Well, uh, Jim, uh, again, it's been a pleasure, and we could always continue to have this conversation. Like I said, I think it would be a great idea to have you on at least quarterly to, to talk about what we're doing together, but also to give our audience updates on Set Apart to Serve. Uh, but one thing we like to, to finish every episode with is if you had a piece of advice to anybody considering church work, whether it be pastor, deaconess, teacher, or anything else like that, what would that one piece of advice be? Um, well... I kind of said earlier, certainly be in the Word, um, so that, the, that the, the Lord may continue to grow that faith and that desire. Um, and not just blow and smoke, but uh, you had mentioned a couple of times, but I really encourage uh, them to go to either Vocatio or Christ Academy. Uh, those are fantastic um, experiences where one can really contemplate, is this really what I want to do or not? So. Yep. Well, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, if you're in high school, come to Boccaccio High School in June or, or go to Christ Academy as well or go to one one summer and go to the next the next summer. Uh, and if you're in college or second career, uh, we have Boccaccio Retreat. Uh, the fall date is probably full, I imagine. Yep. Uh, but there will be another, one be another one in March, I believe. Uh, so look out for the registration for that. Uh, as always, uh, thank you for listening. If you yourself are thinking about church work, don't think too long. Fill out a request for information so we know who you are. We know how to contact you and we can begin the conversation. It's free. It's uh, contract free. So you're not signing your life away by letting us know who you are. And if we talk to you and it's not right, you could even opt out. But I don't think you would do that. Uh, and if you're listening and there's somebody in your congregation that you've always thought this person would be a good teacher, deaconess or pastor, uh, don't think about it. Make sure that you tell them because you could be the person that encourages them to take the next step uh, and, and that provides that spark for, to get them to pursue a career in church work. And who knows, they could be your pastor or teacher someday as well. Uh, again, thank you for listening and we'll see you all under the fig tree next time. Take care.